My name is Dan Austin and we're going to do a little presentation talking about audiovisual basics, components that make up a theater system, uh, what considerations to make when you're looking at home theater equipment, and then we're going to get a little bit into an exciting technology uh, called voice control. Basically using a device with voice commands to get it to do things to operate your home theater equipment. Okay, the first thing I wanted to start with was some considerations on resolution. 4K is a big buzzword right now for home theater equipment. 4K is everywhere. Uh, 4K refers to, we get a lot of people that come and ask us, well, what does 4K really mean? That's actually uh, accounting for the lines of resolution on the image. So for years we were dealing with 720 by 480 in the DVD standard definition market. DVD stands for 720 lines of resolution wide by 480 lines of resolution tall. Then we got to HD, where we had 720 and 1080p resolutions, 1920 lines wide by 1080 tall. A few years ago, Ultra 4K or Ultra HD came to the market, and that is Ultra HD is actually 3840, 3840 pixels wide by 2160 pixels tall. So effectively, it's 8 million pixels on a 4K screen and it's about 2 million pixels on a 1080p screen when you do the math. So it's about four times the resolution of what 1080p can do. So it's, it's pretty significant. When 4K originally came out, it wasn't really that affordable. It was great quality, uh, but it, it just wasn't um, something that everyone had a budget for. Nowadays, 4K is pretty much the price of what 1080p TVs are. In fact, a lot of companies like Sony and Samsung, they're dropping their 1080p images altogether. So there's no options for many companies now to get 1080p. It really is a 4K offering. So I would suggest, and projectors is the other side we're going to talk about, that has come way down in cost for uh, 4K projectors. So I would actually recommend whether you're looking at a TV or a projector, we're now to the point where 4K is affordable. Even though there's not a lot of content right now in 4K, that is growing more and more. Um, I would recommend highly that we look at a 4K TV or projector if we're making a purchase going forward. Let's look at the components that make up a home theater system. You've got obviously your, your sources to start with. They go into an audiovisual receiver. This is the heart of your system. This is going to be doing all of your audiovisual audio visual switching and your audio processing as well. From there we go to a display through an HDMI cable. Your HDMI, as you might be aware, can carry video and audio through the one cable. So it's very convenient and easy to use and run. And then we go out to a speaker system throughout the, the room. That one audiovisual receiver is very important to select the right one because it's doing a, a lot of processing both for audio and video in your system. It's the heart. And of course, your home theater system, if you pick the right setup, can be controlled from a single remote through a control system. There are several different control systems out there. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Uh, we recommend Control 4 because you can do a lot more than just uh, control AV equipment. You can control other smart devices around the home through one brain unit, and it is Alexa enabled. So one voice command can do multiple things, makes it easy. Now let's talk about some projector and TV display considerations when we're selecting home theater equipment. A projector has certain advantages, as does a TV. On the projector side, a projector can project larger images. That's the real advantage of a projector. In a dedicated home theater room that's controlled lighting, no windows, we can get it dark like a room like this, a projector makes a lot of sense. Usually the, the screens start at about 90 inches and go to about 130, 140 inches is the typical screen size for a projector. With a TV, right now, about 85 inches is the cutoff point of getting a TV that's big enough that it's going to be affordable. It has a fantastic 4K image, but if you're going to go beyond 85 inches, you really should be looking at a projector. That's where most uh, theater rooms make sense to do a projector install. Projectors take full advantage of 4K. What I mean by that is, since your 4K talks about the pixel count on an image, the bigger the image, the more important it is to have higher resolution. Because if you've got a 43 inch TV, you can only pack so many pixels into that surface area. 1080p, 4K doesn't look that much better than 1080p on a 43 inch, but now if you're blowing it up on a 120 inch surface area, it's really important to get more pixels on the screen. So 4K projectors can often look better than smaller TVs when you're looking at 4K content because 
you're spreading it out over that biggest surface area, so it's more needed for higher resolution. Projectors can handle a wider aspect ratio. Right now, you're seeing this projector, uh, this presentation in 16 by 9. But projectors have the ability to do cinema wide, which is 2.35 to 1 on the aspect ratio. That's important because if you are going to a movie theater and you watch a movie there, you're seeing it in ultra wide. That's the way the director, most directors, most movies are released for the theater in 2.35 to 1. And so if you watch that on your TV, you'll see black bars on the top and bottom. It'll fill the width, but it won't fill the height. If you pick the right projector and screen combo, you can actually take advantage of ultra wide content for a movie, and then you can switch it back to 16 by 9 uh, for live TV broadcasts, live broadcast TV content. Finally, a projector is ideal, as we talked about, for large rooms with controlled lighting. A TV has an advantage in that it can do more brightness than projectors, and TVs generally have better blacks than projectors. Projectors have come a long way in contrast levels in producing good blacks, but TVs uh, generally have been thought of to have better black levels because of the technology built into them. TVs are usually easier to install. You just throw a mount up on the wall and you put the TV up with a, with a screen and a projector combo. Obviously, you have to account for power in the ceiling for the projector and then a screen install, whether it's a fixed frame screen or a electric or manual pull down screen. I would suggest coming back at 530 today, either here in person or through the live stream and watching, uh, Mike's going to be doing a presentation here on our uh, on screens because there's a whole lot that you can talk about with selecting the right screen material. So TVs are generally thought of for small rooms with more lighting in the room. TVs will still show up nicely if you're in a living room type setting and there's a lot of light. Let's look at a few examples of rooms. General standard theater rooms, something like this. This is where a projector really shines. We've got a little bit of light, but not a lot. It's controlled lighting. We don't have any windows. We've got multiple rows of seating. So a screen is going to make a lot of sense in a room like this, a projector and screen combo. And you can go a lot, lot, lot bigger than a 85 inch TV on the wall. A room like this, that's got a living room with a lot of ambient light, with window light, you'd really have a hard time with getting a projector in this sort of setup to show up and be bright enough for you. So you're going to select a TV for this kind of setup. Even if you do surround in this kind of room, I would still do a TV. There's not a lot of seating. It's not a huge room. TV will work. Now, there are some times when you can do a projector in a living room type environment. And this is where you use, and again, we'll talk more about screens with Mike's presentation later today. But this is an ambient light rejecting screen. And so this kind of screen rejects lights from the bottom, and it only accepts light from front on with the lens. It's important when selecting the screen in this environment to get the right kind because a standard screen is going to wash out and isn't going to look very bright in that environment. There are times, come to us, we can assist you. That's what we're here for. We're local support. Use us and we can help you figure out the right projector screen combo if you have your heart set on a projector. There are also environments where we'll do a TV in a home theater room. It's not, if it's not a very big room, if it doesn't have uh, you know, multiple rows of seating, a, project, or a, a TV, large TV can make sense in a theater room as well. Let's talk about some source considerations. There are typically a few different sources that plug into your home theater equipment. Your smart streaming sources are going to be your Apple TV, Google Chromecast, Roku, and Apple TV, Amazon, uh, sorry, Amazon Fire TV type boxes. These are boxes that don't have hard drives. They connect to your network. They rely on a good quality internet connection. And if you get the right product, uh, they can actually stream 4K and it looks pretty good. Uh, one thing I should mention at this point is you're only as strong as your weakest link in your theater equipment. So if you've got a 4K Roku, for example, and a 4K AV receiver, but you don't have a 4K display, you're, you're not going to be able to see 4K. Everything in line, the cabling, the receiver, the source, and the display all has to be 4K. So keep that in mind if you want to do 4K. A lot of these services, or a lot of these boxes will accept streaming services like Netflix and Hulu. You pay an extra couple dollars a month and then all of their services are available in 4K. As long as you have a good, reliable internet connection, it looks really good. And you don't have to download anything to a hard drive. Another typical source is going to be a live TV source, like a cable or satellite box um, from Comcast, Dish, or Direct. One thing I would strongly look at is a product here from TiVo. We actually sell the product and the TiVo Romeo box is what it's called. 
uh, is a very nice box because a lot of people are cord cutting nowadays. They don't want to pay that expensive cable or satellite fee. And so the, the, the Ro, uh, Romeo box from TiVo allows you to hook up a standard antenna on your roof. You get about 50 channels locally and there's no monthly fee. It's a full DVR box. So you can use it as if you would a standard cable or satellite box, but there is no, uh, no monthly fee. And so you can use it with a channel guide. You can DVR that content right uh, built in and you just buy the box once outright. So consider that for a live TV option. We have a TiVo here we can demonstrate after. Uh, for, a, for a player, I would strongly recommend right now the best box is the Sony UBP X800. Uh, the reason why is because it's under $300 and it can play Ultra 4K, uh, Ultra HD 4K HDR discs as well as standard Blu-ray discs and then standard DVDs. So it can really run the gamut and play any type of disc. Uh, but those new discs, there's over 100 titles that are now available in 4K, uh, can all be played on this player, and it's very affordable. Finally, I would consider a gaming system. And a lot of people will make the mistake of not putting their gaming system in the right place. Uh, if you have AV equipment in a theater room in a closet, you don't want to necessarily put your gaming system back there because the remotes for that gaming system sometimes don't have the range to go through walls. And so we do things like put wall uh, ports on the front of your uh, wall below the screen so that you can plug your gaming system into, con and into a convenient spot and have your remotes uh, wirelessly visible line of sight to that gaming system. So when you're considering uh, sources, keep in mind uh, that those are going to plug into an AV receiver and we want to have the right number of ports for what that AV receiver can handle. Let's talk about a few speaker considerations. Generally, there's thought of to be three different types of speakers. There's an in-wall or in-ceiling type of speaker, a tower speaker, and a bookshelf speaker. These are generally the three different formats. I would say in-wall and in-ceiling speakers is what we do most commonly. Um, the reason why is because they provide a clean look. They're out of the way. There's nothing on your floor. They're usually in the wall, in the ceiling. We have them in this room. It's hard to see on the live stream, but they're up in the ceiling and they're paintable and they actually sound pretty good. They can fit even behind the screen if you get an acoustic weave screen and they are low cost. One of the disadvantages is that sound can bleed into other rooms or through the, uh, through the floor into the, uh, through the ceiling, I should say, into the floor above. And so we do sell a few different brands, specifically Episode makes a back box for their in-wall or in-ceiling screens that I would strongly consider because that keeps the sound uh, in the room that it's intended to be and doesn't let it bleed out as much. Now tower speakers are going to be, uh, they actually, we actually have a couple tower speakers in this room. This is what we'll hear a sound demonstration on, on in a few minutes. Tower speakers have the best overall sound performance. Uh, the reason why is because there's multiple speaker elements built into the tower speaker. The ones we actually have here have three uh, tweeter elements and then it actually has uh, a woofer as well. So there's a woofer and a tweeter element, multiple built into the tower. It's an enclosed box, so you get the best overall sound performance. It does require more room space. You do are setting it on a floor, so that's a trade-off. And then they are generally more uh, expensive because the overall sound performance is better. Finally, bookshelf speakers. This is going to be designed for a room space where you've got a built-in existing cabinetry, right? Uh, that's where you just set it on a shelf, and they are also low cost, similar to in-wall speakers. They sound great. If you've got in-room furniture, it's the way to go. And then the other thing to keep in mind is sometimes an in-wall or in-ceiling speaker can't be mounted in a stud space because you've got to cut out the sheetrock. And so in that situation, a bookshelf speaker makes a great surface mount speaker. We can use a wall mount and we can mount it at the back of the room wherever we can't get an in-wall into the, into the sheetrock. A couple AV considerations to make. As I mentioned earlier, this is the heart of your system. So it's important to pick a few key features when you're, uh, when you're getting an AV receiver. Uh, one, make sure that your, your AV receiver will work with the number of speakers or subs you've selected. You might have heard the term 5.1 or 7.2 receiver. That stands for how many speakers and how many subwoofers it can support, how many channels, independent audio channels it can include. Make sure that your watts per channel is in line with what your speaker rating is. You're going to buy a speaker, it's going to put out a certain watt output. Make sure your speaker, it's not overdriving your speaker. Also, verify your audio processing type. There are a few new sound formats available within the last couple years, specifically Atmos and DTS. 
Atmos is very popular. We actually have this room set up in an Atmos configuration. I'll do a demonstration at the end. Atmos is, is a more uh, theater dimensional sound. So they use sound from above. You have to set up your speakers in a certain environment from, from uh, sound above. And then they can use complex algorithms to actually make it sound as though uh, audio is coming from a place in the room where there's not even a speaker installed. It's a pretty powerful tool. The movie has to be encoded in Atmos and your receiver has to be Atmos enabled in order to do Atmos audio. Make sure your speaker, or your AV receiver has enough audio visual uh, HDMI inputs. Uh, we've had several times where customers have gone out and bought a low cost receiver that might, might only have three or four HDMI inputs and maybe they've got six or seven sources. So we need to make sure we've got also optical and digital coaxial audio inputs as well. We can help you do that math up front before you buy the receiver to make, make sure you get the right, right model. Um, some receivers have smart features, things like music streaming services that are built in, and some receivers have the ability to control them from your phone free of charge. And so if that's important to you, we can look at that feature. Consider secondary zones. What I mean by this is maybe there's a patio zone that you'd like to control that's independent from your home theater room. There are receivers out there that have zone two or zone three capabilities. You can be playing something in your theater room and you can have something totally different playing at its own volume level in another room. And so if we just got a couple zones, a really powerful tool can be a receiver that has a second or third audio zone output. Again, verify video resolution capability, compatibility. What I mean there is if you're gonna play 4K content, make sure your receiver is 4K and vice versa. A few cable considerations. This is probably the biggest issue we have crop up. A customer does a pre-wire. They don't run the right kind of HDMI wire. Now it comes time for post install and they want to do 4K, but the cable they ran isn't 4K capable. It's really important when we run cable that we get the right kind of cable. It's got to be HDMI 2.0 rated. And we recommend cable that exceeds 18 gigabit because uh, even though the 4K discs right now don't require 18 gig, they actually, um, some of the menus of the players do. And we're also future-proofing ourselves a little bit by running this kind of cable. Uh, it'll save you headaches later. Also make sure it's HDR and HDCP 2.2 rated. HDCP 2.2 is a, a newer copyright content protocol that is, uh, exists, that is a communication that happens between your, your disc and your receiver and your display to make sure that content is eligible, eligible to play through. Your cable has to be passing that through. And so we can help you with running the correct cable. Uh, fiber optic cables can sometimes be the solution there. Um, the other thing I would say is if you're running longer than 50 feet, you're really gonna want an active cable because HDMI is a digital signal path and it has something called the cliff effect where if it doesn't sense enough signal, it's not like with the analog days where you'll see a snowy picture, it'll actually just blink out entirely. You won't see anything. It'll just, you'll be watching the image, it'll blink out, and then hopefully it comes back on, but you don't want that kind of performance in your home theater. So you, at longer distances, you want active cables that have a chipset inside each end that reclocks that signal. A few control system considerations. Figure out what you'd like to control. What I mean by this is some people get a product like uh, the Logitech Harmony. It's a good product. Uh, that's going to only control three or four devices in a living room or a home theater room. If you want to control more than that, products like a light switch, a thermostat, uh, maybe a camera, maybe a front door lock, those kind of products can be controlled from a control system processor like Control 4. At the end of this, we're going to be doing a drawing for this exact control, control system processor. It's from Control 4. It's the EA1. It's very powerful. And this brain unit can talk to things in your rack full of AV equipment, and it can also talk to, to devices wirelessly like a light switch and tell them what to do. It could be a very powerful uh, tool. So figure out what you'd like to control in your home. Um, make sure you have the correct number of control ports available. Every device in your rack needs to take up a control port. So we want to make sure we get a brain unit that has enough ports available. Again, I talked about the benefits of Control 4. You can do whole home system as well. So let's say you have three or four or five or six zones of audio. Uh, you can do a multi-zone receiver from a company like Control 4, and that allows you to go out and from your phone or from a remote or even with voice commands to play different content in each room. It's dynamic. It's easy to use. 
uh, and it's affordable. Control 4 also has a nice service called Foresight. This is what allows you to control your system from anywhere in the world. Let's say you're on vacation and you want to turn up your thermostat or turn it down so it'll be at a comfortable level when you get home. Remotely, you can do that all integrated with the Control 4 app, or you can log in and see your security cameras. You don't have six different apps to log into, one for your cameras and one for your... It's all done in one spot. It's very um, easy to use. And then again, consider if you'd like to use Alexa voice control. Simple voice commands. It's not a perfect technology, but it has some really powerful features, which we'll demonstrate in a minute. Let's talk about voice control briefly. What do we mean by voice control? Well, Amazon Alexa is the most common and most popular type of voice control right now. It's a device that connects to the internet. Amazon's Alexa family has several products in it. The Echo, the Echo Dot, the Echo Show. Uh, for this purpose, we recommend the Echo Dot. The reason why is because the Echo Dot has an audio output. And the reason why that's important is the speaker built into the Echo Dot isn't that great. The Amazon Echo products are okay, but the speakers aren't going to be great for high fidelity audio. You can, however, take the audio out and run it through your audio distribution system. I have an Amazon Echo at my house, and we play it in the kitchen. We just give it a command, it'll start playing. But it's not playing through the little speaker on the uh, Alexa. It's playing through our nice kitchen and ceiling speaker, so it sounds really good. So you can take the audio out of the Echo Dot and make that work really well. Um, it's a smart device that connects to the Internet. It responds to voice commands. Uh, it'll tell you the weather, it'll tell you the traffic, it'll tell you tasks tasks that you have to perform that day. And uh, it will also do different things for you, like control your audiovisual equipment. Not any device can be controlled by Alexa. Uh, Alexa has literally over 100,000 products right now that are available with an Alexa skill, is what they call it. It's a device uh, that you have to be compatible with in order to give it a command to work. And I would say it's in the beginning stages still of the perfected te technologies. There's, there's other products. Google has made something similar. Um, it will get better, but your voice inflection and what you say matters. If you're trying to give Alexa a command um, and you say it with maybe one word different, she might not understand you. So you have to be pretty exact. Even the way you enunciate matters with Alexa. So it takes some getting used to. That's one of the drawbacks. That's constantly improving, but it is important to talk to Alexa in a certain manner to get her to, to do what you want. It's interesting. It, it, it opens a whole new world. Uh, yesterday, I, I, I mentioned earlier that we have a Echo at our house, and um, my three-year-old daughter has no idea how to turn on our Control 4 remote. She, she doesn't know, but I came down and she was eating cereal, and she was watching Magic School Bus on Apple TV. And I was like, how did you do that? And she just said, I, I told Alexa to turn on the Apple TV. And it did. And so um, simple voice command, my little three-year-old can use it. Um, and it understood her. And she's now able to uh, do things we don't want her to do. So we'll have to figure that out. But um, there are a few different ways to control uh, an Echo. Uh, one is there are individual AV products that are being released now that you can control on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Uh, Denon has a product, the AVRX 2400, and then the models up that are individually controlled. So if you add that skill to your Echo, you can actually tell it to turn on. You can tell it to switch inputs. And that's a pretty powerful tool. That's free. Optima, which we actually have here, they have a, a projector coming out called the UHD 51A. That one is also individually Echo controlled. And so these devices are nice. The problem with doing it individually is you got to give a command for the receiver to turn on, give a command for the projector to turn on. You're still given three or four commands to do a task. The other way and the more beneficial way to do it is add a Control 4 controller to your theater equipment and then add a skill list uh, built into the Control 4. We can help you with that to control all of your AV equipment with one simple command. So the way it works, you give a voice command to Echo. It then goes out, talks to your brain unit, your Control 4 processor, and then that goes out and controls all the audiovisual equipment that you want to do. It makes things a lot easier. One command is doing about five or six different tasks and accomplishing all that very easily. 